If you would see in Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to continue with the series we've started entitled, The Making of the Priest's Garment. How many of you remember that? The Making of the Priest's Garment. And this is part 5. And if you remember when we started this glorious series, part 1 was the making of the priest's garment. Part 2, covered by the anointing. Part 3, to know the height and depth. How many remember any of this? Part 4. Did I say part 4 already? The sanctification. Sanctification upward. How many remember that one? It's important that you get these tapes because we cannot afford to go back into all of them. So that way you're, you're kept up with what the Lord is saying. Sanctification upward, part 4 and part 5 tonight, starting with Hebrews chapter 5. Now how many of you understand as we've been studying this glorious series that God is bringing, us, is bringing us through a pattern. God is bringing us through a custom. God is bringing us through a heavenly culture. How many of you understand that? And how many of you understand that we're looking at the type and shadow of the Old Testament and seeing the reality of that type and shadow in the New Testament? And how many of you understand that Jesus did not come away to take away the law, which is the Word of God, but He came to fulfill the law? Come on, help me. And how many of you understand that the law is not speaking of the Ten Commandments, but the law is speaking of the standard of God? And how many of you understand that the standard of God is a commandment and a statute? A commandment and a pattern. A commandment and a way. A custom. And so we see the pattern that God has continued from the old to the new. And we see it being fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5, if you remember when we studied this chapter, that God takes a priest, verse 1, God takes a priest from the people, for the people, the things that pertain to God. How many remember that? And how many remember that God will take a man from the people, for the people, and that man it will be surrounded by similar weaknesses, that that man may have compassion on those that are out of the way. Those that are out of the way. Those that are off the track. And that man will have compassion on those that are weak because he himself is surrounded by infirmities. So we could follow that. The ordination is based upon that God takes a priest from the people for the people. That's why Jesus had to be total man. If he was not total man, this would not be true. So you have to understand this. When you think of Jesus Christ, please listen carefully. When you think of Jesus Christ, you can't think of him as just this one guy who was, if you will, uh, supernatural in all his ways, walked on water, spoke to the wind, and spoke out names out of the tomb. You have to understand that this was the Son of God, Son of Man. That He was all man, all God. Do we understand that? He was the fullness. He was the visible expression of the invisible God. He is the firstborn after many kind after Him. How many remember that? The firstborn from the dead. Come on, help me. And how many of you remember that He initiated a kind of people? Yes. And how many of you know we're that kind of people? Yes. How many of you know we are the body of Christ? Yes. How many of you know that if you submit to anything less than that, you're being robbed? Yes. Okay? So God now raises up a priest. Just like He was with Jesus, so was it in the old priesthood. And it continues to say that this man, being the priest, if he was going to do things pertaining to God, this man himself had to be surrounded by weaknesses himself in order for him to have the heart of God for the people. And then it says in verse 4, And no man takes this honor unto himself, but that he that is called of God. Notice this. No man can put this honor on themselves. Nobody calls themselves. God has to do it. As was Aaron, so also Christ. Hear that again. As was Aaron, so also Christ. If you remember, the scriptures were not written by chapter and verses. So you can't stop reading at the end of verse 4. You understand that? That was added later to help us remember where things are written, and I think it's a great idea, but as long as you don't break up the Word of God. So it should read, This was who was called of God, as was Aaron, so also Christ, glorified not himself. Christ exalted not himself. Christ did not call himself. Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but that he that said unto him, Who's he? God that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Now how many remember what this is relating to? How many remember it's relating to the time Jesus was in the Jordan? And how many remember that Jesus had no right to the ministry, had no right to do the first miracle, cast out the first devil, or preach his first sermon, until he was announced? How many remember that? 
And how many he said to John the Baptist, you've got to baptize me or my father won't speak. That was the righteous thing he had to do. And once he was baptized in the Jordan. And how many remember the Jordan is the place that the anointing that it falls off the dew of Hermon ends up in? Come on, how many remember all this? We studied this in the Father and Son series. If, if you remember, the ointment of oil is as the, the, the dew, as that which is upon the head. The dew of Hermon. It's but the dew of Hermon that, that descends upon the mountain. It's like, it's describing a type and shadow. It's the anointing that is upon the head. In the Old Testament, it was Aaron. In the New Testament, the great high priest is Christ Jesus. He's the head. We are the body. How many of you know this? And we understand that the way the anointing of God flows is from the head. God does not anoint the garment. God anoints the head. And the oil is poured upon the head and goes down to the beards, priesthood, down onto the garment, the people of God. And where is the greatest flow of the anointing? The head or the hem? Or the hem? Say one more. Is it at the head or the hem? Anybody remember why? The top of the mountain is only dew. But that which is dew, that which is but a snow, on top of a peak of a mountain, begins to descend. And as it descends, how many remember, it begins to multiply. And how many remember we studied, it begins to flow as a river. And how many remember the river can be seen, uh, 120 whatever miles it was that we studied, from the Dead Sea. And it flows down into the Jordan. How many remember that? And the Jordan flows 127 miles into the Dead Sea. And it dumps six tons of water every 24 hours. That which is but dew becomes a flood. So where is the greatest anointing? Ascending or descending? Hallelujah. What does the Jordan mean? Descender. Jesus is in the Jordan. Being baptized. When he is raised from the Jordan, it's as a dove. The voice of God. As a dove. Descending. Speaking his word and announcing him. This is my beloved son. And the commandment continued. And the inheritance continued from father to son. How many remember the father and son covenant? And this continued from father to son. And only then was Jesus pronounced. And he said, this day I have begotten thee. That doesn't mean that this day we are born. It means that this day I'm making the announcement. You are my son. And how many remember that if you are a servant, you're no different than a slave. Even though you're a son. How many remember the book of Galatians? That means not until you've reached a position of maturity are you are going to be declared, announced. And then it continues to say, and he says it in another place, in other words, he says in another place of Scripture, Thou art a priest forever. How long? Forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Now I know this is familiar, but you've got to pay close attention to it. So here we see that there is a priesthood that is called an order. It is a priesthood of a righteous king. It is a royal priesthood priesthood. And this is a priesthood that is after Christ. Christ is after this order of Melchizedek. Listen very carefully. This is the highest priesthood. This is the most anointed priesthood. And as we continue to study the anointing upon the garment, we have to understand where we are in God and where God has brought us to and why the purposes of God have led us to a point in time in God's timetable, if you will, where God's great abundance of outpouring, the hem, if you will, is about to be revealed. Listen very carefully. The priesthood of Aaron is a type and shadow, and it carried a certain dimension and portion of glory. The priesthood that came in the New Testament is but an earnest of our inheritance. It is the deposit. It gives us the promise of the greater glory that shall follow. How many remember that? And how many remember the heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11 died not receiving the promise? Come on, help me. And how many of you know that even though they were heroes of the faith and out of weakness? Somebody say, out of weakness? Out of weakness. See, out of weakness, they did the things that pertain to God. If you think you're going to come to God being a he-man and a full of power and muscular in the spirit and you're going to do all kinds of glorious things and you can have imaginations in your mind of turning the world upside down in the name of Jesus, I think you got the wrong God. But if you want to serve the living God of heaven and earth, you're going to have to come on hands and knees and one step at a time because you're desperate for His mercy. Remember, fear is the beginning of wisdom. I don't mean terror, but reverence enough that terrorizes you. How many of you understand that? How, how many of you, I mean, we really got to get hold. How many of you understand that, that the Word of God... Uh, describes him as one you don't want to mess with. 
How, how many of you understand that? And people of the Lord, hear this very carefully. God will wink at our uh, immaturity. But when He's given you something that's going to require more of you, to whom much is given, much is required, and what happens is, is that this is the place God begins to look for you to take the keys to the house and to drive your father's car and begin to participate in the family business. And this is the place of where the father begins to get on your nerves. Can you, and as a type and shadow, can you understand what I'm saying? This is a place where the baby is not cute anymore. Okay? And when you wee-wee on the carpet, it's not funny anymore. How many, of you, how many of you hear what the Spirit is saying? So there comes a place in our life where God's going to expose to you His awesomeness. We've been singing about it, but we've got to get a hold of it. And God, when He exposes this awesomeness to you, hear this very carefully, you stop toying. And you begin not to walk in works and not to walk in do's and don'ts and not to reapply the law. You're going to walk in a state of being that is in worship. An expression within you that has had a taste of the awesomeness of God and understanding God is full of grace and full of truth. You, on the other hand, as His Son, listen carefully, understand that not only is He in you, but He's also looking for you to be in Him. And John 17 is describing not only I in them, but them in us. Which means that you've got to come to a place where you cross over. Crossing over is the place of the Jordan. Crossing over means no longer just going through the woes of the wilderness. Crossing over means you come to the place where it's no longer just Christ in you, but now it's you in Him. Now you're pursuing Him. Can you understand what I'm saying? And how many remember we studied that, that you being in Him is that which is the fulfillment, the participation. How many remember that the last time we got together? How many remember Him being in you is fulfilling what He's done for you? Past, present, and future. Christ in me is the fulfillment of God's Word. But me in Christ, on the other hand, is that pursuing of Him. Until that very power, where we say, like Paul, I don't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with power and demonstration. And if you remember, the anointing flows, come on, you should remember this. How many remember? The anointing flows downward, right? How does sanctification flow? Say that with me again. Sanctification? And it's a sacrifice. And that point that you lift, that's the highest point of your sanctification, is where the anointing flows from. Did you understand that? In a man's stature, his head is the highest point. So if man will surrender that, that's the highest point. In that sanctification, that's the point of the flow of God's uh, anointing. And if you remember, we have to work this anointing. And I, when I say work it, I've got to make this very clear. I don't mean pumping it. That means we make the garment. How many remember that in the book of Exodus? God said, bring about the wise hearted. And they shall make the garment. How many remember? And the garment has to be made for glory and beauty. Anybody remember any of this? And how many remember who makes the garment? The people. Who wears it? The priest. Where is the oil poured? What do the sons wear? The garment. Does the oil pour on the sons or on the father? Do the sons receive less or more? Do their sons receive less or more? Is it multiplied from generation to generation? We all are clear on that, right? So we understand the anointing of God is going to flow downward. But the sanctification is going to flow upward. And this is the place where it's not only Him and you, but you and Him. Okay? One of the ways to measure, because we have to know ourselves, in the Spirit, I mean. We have to understand that if something is but a letter to you and not a mes manifestation, listen carefully. And I don't want to turn this into a working, but it's got to come out of that union. You understand? It comes out of that covenant. It comes out of that oneness with Him. If there is something in your life but, that is but a word and not power, it's yet still the letter and not the Spirit. That's not a condemning thing, but it's an inventory thing. That means that if we say our belief, but the demonstration of what we say is lacking, in that portion of our life needs to be an upward sanctification. 
not a working thing, but a relationship, a, a relational thing. That means that in that sanctification, in that sacrifice, if you will, the, 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 the anointing of God flows. Are, are you all... If I could say it to you another way. How many of you believe that we are saved by grace? Now, how many of you also believe that we're to be holy before God? Okay, let's try that one more time. How many of you believe we're supposed to be holy before God? Now, how many of you also believe that if you fail, He's faithful to forgive you? But how many of you also believe that if you say no to a thing, if you set the standard in your life, not out of law, but the fulfillment of the righteousness of the law. Paul said in Romans 8, that the righteousness of the law, the standard, the Word of God, may be revealed. Where? In us. So we have to hear, get a hold of this now. As much as we understand the grace, it's all by His grace. And as much as we understand that God is faithful, and as much as we understand the mercy and the cleansing of His blood, and as much as we understand that God has given us all things in Christ Jesus, there is yet the crossing over into priesthood. And priesthood comes and He makes a sacrifice. If you remember in the book of Hebrews, it describes it very clearly that He brings a sacrifice in the first verse first that he may offer gifts and sacrifices now we understand that in the old covenant it was a type and shadow year by year that the priest would come and he would make sacrifices for himself and for the people Christ comes and he does it all is that not right yes. now how many of you understand that that doesn't mean that now you are just hanging out how many of you understand you pick up the cross too come on help me and how many of you know he's the forerunner say forerunner, forerunner. firstborn does that mean you follow after Him in the same footsteps? Or you're just kind of hanging outside knowing that it's finished? Come on, help me. Say this. Position and experience. We've got to have the experience. Right? So that means the power is in the experience. So that which is just but a word, listen carefully. The word is that which is true. But it's got to become fact. Experience. And so therefore, God brings us to the place where that which is downward is also brought back upward in order for that to become joint. And he that ascended also descended that he may fill how many things? All things. But listen to this very carefully. If you remember, Jesus didn't die just for us. Jesus also died as us. So that means we're not exempt from the death. And as Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection that I may be conformed unto his death, right? Conformed. That I may know him, that I may become a, a fellow heir, that I may also participate in the very same experience. Now, if we understand that God brings about a priesthood, and this is our royal priesthood, we have to understand that the first kind of priesthood is that but a type and shadow, and all the mechanics and all the working and all the serving in the temple is describing something that we experience in the spirit. How many of you understand that? How many of you understand the oil of... They took literally oil. And they beat the olives. And they would get that oil. And they would get enough oil. Some people complain that I, get, I put too much oil on your forehead. Guess how many quarts of oil they got. I'll show it to you in a minute. Well, I'll just tell you. Anybody want to know? They received six quarts of oil. Anybody have an oil change? Anybody need one tonight? When you take your car into the, to the garage, they normally give you four quarts. God wanted to be for man. Six. It's a, a gallon and a half of oil. Six quarts. And they'll take six quarts of oil. And not until the priest was properly dressed. You've got to get a hold of this now. Type in shadow again. Until his undergarments were first taken care of. His inward life was taken care of. Can you hear what I'm saying? The people made this. The people covered the priest. And like I told you. It's the people that exposed the minister. Like I told you, it was Noah's son that was happy to find his father naked. The glory of God is on the garment. God never anoints the flesh. God never anoints your body. God never anoints your nakedness. God anoints the garment. And on that garment, listen carefully, they would wear that undergarment. And then they would put the ephod over it. And then they would wear that girdle. And they would wear the breastplate. We'll study more of that in another series. And they would take the turban and wrap it around their head. And they would take that crown 
And until you took your rightful position that is in Christ Jesus, the oil could not be poured, and they would pour oil on top of the crown. And they would take six quarts of oil, and they would pour it upon the crown of the Father. And he would get drenched, and they would bring him before the priest and the congregation. And they would take the oil, and they would pour it upon his head. And that oil would just pour down his face onto his beard, and it would drip on his garment. But listen very carefully. This oil was made in a certain way. It wasn't just olive oil, virgin oil, or more virgin oil. It was not Publix. It was not something that you just went and got off of some olive tree. It had to be specifically made with the proper measurements. They would take certain ingredients and they would take the shekels describing weights. Shekels are not dollar or coins. Shekels were weights. They would have a scale. And the way a value of a thing was determined by the shekel. Can you understand that? And so if a shekel, for example, was one ounce, and God said, now bring this particular ingredient, and you put it on the other side of the scale, and you put only one ounce, only one ounce was the measure. But if God would bring a shekel that is, for example, five and a half ounces of another ingredient, and you have to pour on the other side that other ingredient, and put the shekel, the weight, on the other side, and when it was perfectly balanced, it had to be perfect. If it wasn't perfect, it was used to bury people. But if it was perfect, it was used to fill the house of God in fragrance. And it was a perfume. And this perfume was uh, so sweet and so beautiful that you could not help but smell it. In fact, it was a very strong aroma. You ever walk in the mall and some woman walks by who's been drenched? And it either kills your nose, or you want to go buy another bottle. Come on, help me a little bit, as a type in shadow. It's the same kind of thing. Sometimes you smell this aroma, and this aroma would get penetrated into the garment. And you covered your body with it. Are you all getting hold of what I'm saying? You didn't wash yourself. You weren't allowed to pour it on your flesh. Flesh can't be anointed. It's got to be the garment. Got it? So therefore, they would wear that garment, and the, the sons did not receive the oil on their heads. The sons received the oil from the garment. The oil had to be poured on the head, and the garment was simply that which received the afterflow. And the sons would then be raised, and they would wear that garment, and they had to wear it seven days. They had to wear it until they got used to the odor, the smell, the weight of priesthood, they had to be prepared until they com were completed. Seven, number of completion. Until they were completed in that rightful practice of priesthood. So that way they did not take advantage of the people. They didn't take advantage of their position because God anoints the position. You've got to hear that very carefully. And because God's anointing, God's choosing is upon that oil. You see, if people come against the anointing, this is when God comes in judgment. Because, let me tell you something. When God puts a garment on a man and that man uses his garment for his own gain, he's got a problem. Big problem. And David better not touch Saul, even though Saul's the killer. This is the place where you know I ain't touching it. Why? Because if you are like the youngest son, the most immature son of Noah, who couldn't wait to show the nakedness of his father, he was cursed, and he had to serve his brethren, and even for tribes later, and generations later, they were slaves to the older brothers. How many of you know that? That continued. So here is Noah who wakes up out of his drunkenness, being naked, and his other sons that covered him, he comes up and he still got the word of God in his mouth. Why? Because he was covered again. Who covered him? His sons did. Who make the garments? The people do. We, we all got all that. Okay. It's important. It's really important that you get a hold of this. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, very familiar scripture. Quickly now, I'm, Lord have mercy on me. I was hoping by now I'd be way further ahead than we are. But, bless God, we'll continue more on Sunday. Anybody plan to come back? First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Okay? He's given us first of all that which is of a type and shadow. Now he's bringing us onto the place where it's no longer stones, temples, but now we are that living stone. You also lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, 
to offer up. Everybody say offer hum where? To offer up spiritual sacrifices, no longer animals, but spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you see the pattern did not stop. But now it is a spiritual experience, no longer a technical experience. And this is a holy priesthood offered upward. Jump down to verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar or a treasured people, that you should show forth. How are you going to do this? Show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, as much as we have heard that so many times, we have to really pay close attention to what the Scripture is saying. It says we are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. This is describing a kingly priesthood. Please listen carefully. A king was not allowed to enter into beyond the veil. A, a king could not do the work of the priest in the Old Covenant. God now raises up in the New Testament an order of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek priesthood is a higher order of, of, of a priesthood that has, listen carefully, has never existed before. So please don't go by what familiar thing we've heard. We've got to really get a hold of the reality of truth in this thing. This Melchizedek priesthood is a royal priesthood that is not only capable of being a king, which is a sovereign ruler who can give command, who can destroy the enemy, who's wealthy, who rules a nation, but is also a priest. Can you hear that? Who's able to come and minister in a priest's office and do the ministry of a priest for the Lord and for the people. Remember this, included in the meaning of the word priest, you might want to write this down, included in the meaning of the word priest, obviously a priest means one set apart, but included in that word to be a priest means a mediator, a, a go-in between, between God and man. A priest was a bridge. A priest was that which was a channel through which God moved. The pattern never changed in Christ. Now we have to listen to this very carefully. As much as we see an order from Father to Son in the Old Testament, the Son of, the Son of, the Son of, He so saw, begat so and so, we have to also see that Jesus came and He was a continuation from the Father to the Son. Listen carefully. In that sonship, there is a many membership. In that sonship, there is many members of one body. And in that sonship, there is a head, a high priest, and there is shoulders, a priesthood carrying the ark. That's where the authority lies. That's where the government is. There is a body or the garment, and this body or garment is many members. And the head does not say to the feet, I have no need of thee. There is an order even to this spiritual body and God tells us in Ephesians 4 that to equip the body to edify the body that the body is not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and they're not fooled by every craftiness God gives a, 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 a if you will gifts and these gifts are how many remember apostles and prophets evangelists pastors and teachers and they're not just positions they are functions and these functions are part of the body. These functions are organs that give life to the cells. If they're out of whack, then the whole body is deformed. So as much as we see a function in the old order, we see a function in the new. Okay? Now God is bringing about a royal priesthood. Listen very carefully. This royal priesthood is walking within an authority and they are a generation of people. Not in just a certain time, but a generation. And this generation is a royal priesthood. This royal priesthood is a nation, a people. Spiritually speaking, they are a treasure. Okay? And when it says they are a royal priesthood, it is describing the highest order of priesthood that has ever existed. Jesus Christ, hear this, is the great high priest of that order. Okay? Now, you really got to stay with me now. This is so good. I need it. This priesthood order is not talking about him anymore. This priesthood order is showing him. It's showing forth the praises of him. Showing forth the praises. Not songs and dance, but the glory 
the outcome, the praises, the victory, the triumph. Can you all hear what I'm saying? They're showing forth the praises of him. So this royal priesthood is not just somebody who's trying to perfect something that has been. This is a whole new, or if I say new order. It means that we're not going to try to perfect. God is not looking to perfect something or improve that which has been. God is not going to try to gift, to make the gifts work better. God is not going to increase the anointing. Help me, Jesus. Listen carefully. God is not going to bring about better fruits or better men of God. And God's not going to bring up better performing people and better conducts and people who are going to do right things and people who are going to judge between this one and that one. Listen very carefully. This royal priesthood, this, this, this new order of royalty of priesthood has never been before. It means it functions with a whole new kind of an anointing. Listen to this very carefully. It is bringing about a, a producing an anointing after an order of priesthood that has never existed before. And this new outflow of anointing is Christ himself. Okay? If you remember, Aaron was the great high priest, but Aaron was also a flop. How many remember that? How many remember he made the golden calf? How many remember he also fell apart when the pressure was heavy? Okay? Now God raises up a new priest, a great high priest. All man. Everybody say all man. all man. Say one more time. All man. All say one more time pointing at yourself. All, all man. Okay. Also, all, come on, all God. A royal priesthood. Heaven and earth coming together. The higher heaven. Now, this priesthood is showing forth the praises of him. This is the anointing of the feast of the tabernacles. It's the final celebration. You might want to write this down. It is the strongest. See, the reason I want to say this to you is so that way uh, we understand not only some spiritual truth, but we also understand the plan of God. Anybody want to know the purpose? Okay, please listen carefully. The purpose is, people of the Lord, is that God is not going to increase fruits. God's not going to increase anointing. God's going to bring about a whole new order of anointing. How many remember those three kinds of anointings in Scripture? Come on, how many remember? How many remember what they are? Anybody remember what they are? Poured on. Come on, what's the next one? Rubbed? No, the next one is smeared. And the third one? Rubbed in. Third kind. What was the baptism of the Spirit? The earnest of our inheritance. Down payment. What's that feast called? Pentecost. So we have to remember this now. This priesthood is after uh, the final celebration. The greatest celebration of them all. The tabernacling of God, if you will. And so in this, we have the strongest anointing. This is what I want you to write down. The strongest anointing in the highest priesthood in the final celebration. Get it? One more time. You ready? Are you, all, are you all okay? Are you all writing this down? Are you all just staring at me in a coma or are you all into this? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> One more time. It is the strongest anointing in the highest priesthood in the final celebration. This celebration is called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a feast. If you remember... This is a type and shadow that we see the children of Israel celebrating a feast. Three kinds of feasts. You remember what they were? God told them to celebrate them three times. They have to celebrate those things three times every year upon the earth. The first one is Passover, the blood of the Lamb, passing from death to life, speaks of Jesus. The second one, the second feast. This is really should be old review. Second feast, Passover, I'm sorry, a Pentecost. Speaks of Sinai, the word of God being given to them. God said, from now on you'll celebrate the feast called Pentecost. 1,500 years they celebrated it. Was fulfilled. The book of Acts. How many of you remember that? The book of Acts is but a deposit. Think of all the glory. But a deposit. Both been fulfilled. Third, is God coming to experience. Everybody say experience. 
We have it positionally. But experientially, we're coming into that glorious feast. Listen carefully. In this feast, there is a fragrance, an anointing that has never been before. A priesthood that has never existed before. A glory that has never been before. You got to hear this, people of God. All personified in Christ Jesus. We all, we all understand that? So if you can understand this, we've seen the, the blood in the outer court. Anybody glad for the blood? We've seen the baptism of the Spirit in the center court. Anybody glad for the baptism? Has anybody experienced the baptism? Are you sure? You've got to have the down payment. But do you realize we're coming into the glory? It is an aroma. In this aroma, it changes the temple. Go post move. You've got to hear this now. People of the Lord, this is not going to be. It's on us. You can't just hear the letter. You gotta get the reality of it. People are waiting for me to rapture. There is a greater rapture. There is a priesthood, treasured, hidden, secret, not obvious. They're on the side of the mountain. You can't see obviously. It's the glory. It's upon us. It's gonna be a it would say quick work. Double portion. Multiplication. Beyond what you could think. Beyond what you could ask. It is the abundance of God. In a measure. Mankind. Hallelujah. Has never seen it before. You got to get a hold of this. You can't afford to go by where you've been. You can't live by your mood. You can't let your circumstances determine your going. You got to get a hold of this. This is God. I mean in the dimension of glory that has never been experienced by any priesthood ever. It is an order of Melchizedek. It is after the power of an endless life. It has no descendants, no father, no mother. It is the priesthood that receives from downward, upward. People of God, it's been preached about. This order will show... Show forth the praises of Him. Some people will die off and a new generation will rise up. Some will have the letter and be bypassed by those with the spirit of it. Listen carefully. I'm seeing it. I, you know, it's almost like the waters begin to seep from under the door. This royal priesthood if I could say this to you, in the last 2,000 years, 2,000 years, people have become, if you will, numbed by the message. People have become uh, monotonous in it. They become experts in talking about it. 2,000 years, people have been talking about him. Every Sunday. Sometimes Saturdays, depending on what denomination you're a part of. And a handful of people may show up in the middle of the week talking about him. 2,000 years talking. And they become learned in what they talk. This is not a criticism. This is just, it's part of the pattern. But now God comes along and he says, this is an order. Command. A priesthood. Listen carefully. They will come into an anointing of God. Not because of them, but because of God's choosing. No man calls himself God called. God has to call him. This is my beloved. No more talking about him. Now it's growing up into the head. Even Christ, Ephesians tells us. And so we see here that this order, see Ephesians 4.15 tells us, we grow up into the head. But before you get to 15, you've got to see the outpouring. The outpouring is Christ gives gifts. The pouring downward, descending. And he gave some to be. And he describes the functions. Say function. It's not position. It's not an office. It's not some title. Please, people of God. It is a function. It is an authoritative function within a body. Do you understand that? I can't make a nose out of my heart. It won't work. And this function begins to work to edify and to equip the body of Christ. This begins to 
do a spiritual building upward. Building itself up. Growing up into the head. That you may not be no longer tossed. You got to stay up with me. Tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That you no longer are deceived and easily lured by crafty men. There's a discernment that comes with this edification. Now Jesus comes along and he says this in John 14. He says, and greater things shall you do. Remember, it passes on. Greater things shall you do. Why? Come on. Anybody remember what he said, John 14, 12? Why? Because I go to the Father. You see, it's got to be that way. So I'm going to go up so I can pour it back down. Now, Spirit of the Son enters into our hearts. We cry, Abba! You're saying the same thing twice. Abba, Father. Abba is the name Father. It's not Abba, Father. It's Abba. Father is just a translation. <laughs> it's Abba. Say Abba. Abba. Now you want to say it in English? Say it again. It's okay. Father. <laughs> Spirit enters into our hearts. We cry, Abba! Thank you. You can say Father too. It's okay. I know you want to, so sorry, go ahead. And now we see, because he went to the Father, remember? And greatest thing, because I go to the Father. And then we find out, this outflow is the power of an endless life according to Hebrews 7. Now, if we're going to see this, there has to be according to the order of sanctification. If we're going to see this in our life, there has to be that order. There has to be that, that part that uh, is functional within our life and God has a standard and, and I, I really want to give it to you before Sunday can I, can I take another oh I'm going to take it anyhow bless God without the order the, the earth swallows you up okay you become swallowed up in the earth so if you want to turn to number 16 I'll show it to you say pattern numbers chapter 16 Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes I hate the clock. No, I always hate the clock. Number 16, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you out of the Amplified. And here is Korah who comes with his people who is somewhat challenging, jealous, of the anointing of God that is upon the priesthood. And so it tells us in verse 1 of chapter 16 that Korah came with all those elders, if you will, around him. And he took these men, and it says in verse 2, and they rose up before Moses with a certain of the Israelites, 250 princes or, or leaders of the congregation called to the assembly, men well known and of distinction. Now, the King James tells us that our renown, and in other words, these were not just whomever. These were uh, those that were of position among the congregation. And they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, Enough of you. I'm reading out the Amplified. too much upon yourselves, seeing that all the congregation are holy. So in other words, you're trying to do too much on yourself. We're holy too. So you got, you got to see this. They're coming in a, in a, in a challenge. They're coming onto Moses um, and they're saying to him, you're, you're, you're doing too much. You're taking too much upon yourself. It's not like we're here to help you. We're letting you know that we're holy too. And the Lord is among us also. In other words, we don't need you. I want you to see the pattern. 
You take too much upon yourself, seeing that all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you lift yourselves up above the assembly of the Lord? Verse 4. And when Moses heard this, he fell upon his face. The reason, by the way, he fell upon his face is because he knew what was about to happen and he didn't want to see it happen. And he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him, him who he has chosen. Everybody said chosen. Will he cause to come near to him? So you've got to see this now. God chooses. And according to the choosing of God. This is not something men can do. Only God can do. And in verse 8, Moses said to Korah, Here I pray you, the sons of Levi. Now, let me just say this real, real uh, quickly for you. That There was a tribe out of the, the, the sons of Levi. They were called Levites. And they had a certain order. They were allowed to minister in the, in the duties of the temple. God gave the promise of the seed of Abraham to all the children of Israel. But not all the children of Israel were allowed to serve in the position of a priest. It had to come from, if, if you remember, Aaron and his sons were the priests. How many remember that? And the Levites were the son of Levi, and they were not the priests, but they're the ones that served in the temple. How many remember that? And that means that they're the guys that took care of cleaning, they're the guys that took care of the serving, they're the guys that took care of all the duties of taking care of the temple, temple. But then there's the priesthood that was allowed to enter into the office of the priest and minister unto the Lord. And this one had to be a priest and it had to be Aaron or his sons. The Levites were not allowed to enter in and do the serving of the priest's office, okay? So now they're coming to him and they're challenging Moses and they're basically saying to Moses, you know, you're taking too much upon yourself, you're thinking too much of yourself, God is among us too. We got the anointing of God on us. We're able to do the position of the priest too. Now remember, these people were servants. These were princes. These were renowned. They were people of distinction. That means they're able to serve and do their duties. And so Moses comes basically to them and says, look, in verse 9, he says, does it, does it seem but a small thing to you that, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation to, of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. So that he's, what, he's, what he's saying to them here in verse 9 is, are you, are you saying to me that it's not enough to you that God separated you and chosen you to serve the people in the congregation? Are you telling me that, 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 that uh, that's not enough? Now they're beginning to challenge his position and they're wanting to be the, the priests also. And so he says to them in verse 10, and that he has brought you near to him and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you, would you seek the priesthood also? You all seen this? And so I want you to... Uh, now, now, so they, they, they make a challenge. So Moses says, I'll tell you what, let's see what's going to happen in the morning. So turn to verse 30. And if the Lord causes a new thing to happen, everybody say a new thing to happen. What's going to happen? And the earth opens its mouth and swallow them up with all that belongs to them. And they go down alive into Sheol, the place of the dead. Then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Verse 31. As soon as he stopped talking. Now, you've you got you to hear this. Wait, don't, don't read on. Moses is telling them this. Okay? God is waiting for Moses to stop talking. Because God can't do anything until Moses stops talking. He's got to bring the word. Bring the command. After he stops talking, here's what happens. Verse 32. Well, back to verse 31. As soon as he stopped speaking, the ground under the offenders split apart. And all the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and Korah and all his men and their possessions. They and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, the place of the dead, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the assembly. Hmm, it's right. They would say, hmm. So, we have to see something here that when the order is broken, you see, here, here's, here's what happens here. Here's how we lose the flow. Please, 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 please. People of God, I beg of you, you've got to get a hold of it. The way we lose the flow 
is when we break the rank. This has nothing to do with who's greater. Remember, who's the greatest? The one that serves. It has nothing to do with the personality or the position. Please, don't ever think of it that way because, you see, that will produce, as we learn about the art of the apothecary later, it's going to produce the wrong aroma. The right aroma of the oil in the anointing, in the perfume, after the perfumer, has to be that which is rightly divided according to the, to the ingredients. And if we understand that God brings about the ingredients just right, and so therefore, if we come and we lose the outflow of that priesthood, we lose the ingredient of the power. And what happens is, is you'll become a people, if you will, where there is a, a, a working, but it's earthly. The earth swallows you up. It's describing it's dead. It doesn't have no life in it. What makes a priesthood a success, and I don't mean money, I mean a power, a standard that brings change has got to be the anointing. If there is no anointing on the priesthood, it's dead works. Have you ever heard someone dead? And there's a certain aroma. you got to follow with this. There's a certain aroma to it. Sometimes I'll flip through television and there's a certain aroma. I can't stand it. Christian television, Lord have mercy. But sometimes I'll flip through a certain thing and I'll see a cer certain thing or I'll, I'll see a certain thing and it just, oh, provokes me. It, 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 it grieves my spirit. I turn it off. I change the channel. There's times I turn the channel and I see some, some tattooed, not that there's anything wrong with a tattoo, but long-haired, loud music singing about the devil. It does the same thing to me. Ah, yeah. Now, let me give you an example. And I'm not saying this because it happened to me. Everybody say example. I went to Indiana, and while I was there, I had to go there early because uh, early Friday morning, a TBN wanted me to come on the air in the state of Indiana. And so I, I went there early and, and uh, I'm sitting there quietly and I entered into this phenomenal uh, studio. Now, I'd never been on TBN before, hallelujah, and, and uh, the Lord opens this door and I'm thinking, Lord, you sure? And I felt to go, so anyway, I went and they had uh, all their schedule. I want to just show you how God is. Everybody say God is. So they had this schedule. I, re I got the video at home. They got this schedule, and the schedule is they're going to interview this person, they're going to interview that person, and then they're going to interview this person, and then they're going to come to Benny's brother, and they're going to interview me. Praise God. Everybody say praise God. So this is aired in the state of Indiana, and it's by a, a relative of, of, of the people that are in California. And so I get to the, st to the platform uh, after when this brother was finished, and um, they bring myself on with this pastor. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness, people of the Lord, uh, I was not comfortable, to say the least, but I knew God had me there. And as soon, I mean as soon, as I sat down, all of a sudden I get this, this heat. I mean, I'm burning up. People think I sweat because I'm fat. I sweat because of the Holy Ghost. Maybe a little bit of fat, but mostly the Holy Ghost. And I begin to sweat. And so uh, they want to put the, they, they want to, there's a lady singing on the other side and they're, they're coming to, you know, take the sweat off. Well, there ain't nothing you can do. It's going to keep coming. You can put all that stuff on me. It ain't going to work. So the sweat is coming and I'm telling you the glory of God. So they asked me a very simple question. What is God saying to you? Now wait, now wait. I'm telling you, hallelujah, God began to pour. I mean, poor. So wait. So the wife of the, of the host, who's a relative, you understand, is directing. They give you a, uh, this, these cards where your time is running out. I'm supposed to only get the only small portion. But I went to the next portion. And then the next portion. And they, she goes, go, go. She's doing this to me. Tears coming down her face. Go. And I mean, I talked about sons of God. The Father Spirit. I got the video. The phones are going crazy. And the power of God comes and these cameramen, tears, the woman who's the wife of the general manager who's either a son or a nephew to the people in California. They come up after the... It was an hour later. An hour. The outpouring of the Spirit of God takes place. 
They, after, the hours, after this hour of just, I mean, you know, I could preach. And hour went, went just like no time at all. And the hour was over. And when it was over, these people came back and said, when can you come back? I said, I don't know. You're going to come back. And this woman says to me, she takes her mic off because in case people are in the back hearing her. And she says to me, she takes her mic off, you know, those. And she says, you got to come back quick. I was dying. And I feel like I'm living again. you got to come back quick. And I mean to tell you, my, my, my spirit felt this. Oh, Jesus, this outpouring. And I could not help this except realize it's the fragrance on the garment. They could smell it. They didn't want to interrupt it. You've got to go with it. You can't break the order of the perfume. You can't mix the ingredients. It's got to be measured just right. And if we come out of the order of this rank, this priesthood. If we come to like these people and say, I got my own anointing. Listen, it may be true, but if you want the outpouring so you don't become a debtor and don't become swallowed up and taken out to where the dead live and have a dead word and a dead ministry and a dead priesthood. Can you all hear what I'm saying, people of God? Where now it's performance. Now it's going to the motions. Now it's, there's no reality in it. It's just, words it's the letter and i don't care what a great knowledge it may be and i don't care what scholarship it's got in it if it doesn't have the anointing the power of god that breaks the yoke of bondage if it does not have the outpouring down from the beard and it begins to flow into your jordan and people lie down in it and rise back up changed and made new again if it's not the jordan that separates you from the wilderness to the promised land it's the place that priests put their feet into the Jordan. That's the place you hold up the Ark of the Covenant high. That's where the glory of God comes. That's where it's no longer the just the down payment of the Spirit. It's the outpouring. Man has never seen it before. I want you to hear me, people of the Lord. The way they're going to tell, people are going to know the difference if they have never seen it, if they've never heard it, if they don't know any revelation, if they've never heard of any truth, if they don't know the Greek or the Hebrew, when there is a priest that has the performance, I mean the perfume upon them and not the performance. When they've got the life of the Spirit flowing out of them, people are going to turn. And they say, you know, he looks like an ordinary man, but he's no ordinary man. He may have the look of a carpenter, but this is the Son of God. He may be a man who works with his hands, and he may be the least of his brethren. But this, some about this man, he's the Son of... Have you seen this man? Have you said, listen to him? There's some about him that makes you want to sit still and take in every word. There's some about him that bypasses your brain, gets down into your spirit. His word is spirit and his word is life. I don't understand what he's talking about. All I know is he's changing my life. You got to hear it. People of the Lord. Listen, 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 listen. In chapter 17, turn quickly, chapter 17, Numbers. You've got to hear this now. Chapter 17, they come to Moses. And they're trying the order of God. You see, people of the Lord, can I, can I just say this to you before you start reading? Uh, number 17. We have to understand this. This has absolutely nothing to do with any man. Do you understand that? Do you realize that I had nothing to do with the anointing of God on my life? Do you know that you have nothing to do with the anointing of God on your life? Do you know that we've simply been chosen of God? Who's going to come against God's elect? Can, can you understand this? It has nothing to do with any of us. If God chooses it. So here they come and they're challenging Moses again. And Moses, I'll tell you what, every man get a, a rod out of his family. Get all the rods. Out of, the, out of the tribes, 12 of them, if I remember right. And he says, we're going to lay it inside and see what happens. How many remember the story? Verse 7, And Moses laid up the rod before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that, that the morrow, the next day, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron 
for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed, blooms and yielded almonds. Got to hear this. You see, they had, all had rods, okay? And their rods had their history. I'm almost done, so please stay with me. They had history upon their rods. They would carve their family history. And so everybody brought the family rod, and they took their rods, everybody, and they put them. Moses said, tell you what, let's see who God has chosen. Because, hey, this is not to do with him. That's what he's saying. They took all the rods, and they put them into the tabernacle. And Moses says, whoever rod buds, whoever has life on it, life on the next day, that's the one God's chosen. Kind of simple, right? You bring your stick, I bring mine, we put it into the tabernacle, and whoever gets the budding, that's the one God's chosen. So listen carefully. Now, please, people of God, I really need your undivided attention. They bring their rods, and they put it inside the tabernacle. Rod not only budded, but then it bloomed. And not only did it bloom, but it had almonds. It produced fruit overnight. They take a wooden stick, a branch, in other words. You understand a branch? They put the branch, this branch, into the tabernacle. I wish we had time to get into Isaiah 11. Oh, the rod, the branch. And they put the rod, the branch, into the tabernacle. And the very next morning, it buds and it blossoms and it's got almonds on it. Like God's going to make this really obvious. Like if you can't see the anointing of God, let me make it blossom for you. Let me produce a little bit more glory on it. And if that doesn't do it, I'll make it so it's fruitful overnight. How long? I don't know what happened. I drove by the street and there was no cars there. And once tonight, maybe 50 people. And I come back the next day and, my God, this building can't hold the glory. Over. you got to hear this, people of the Lord, because this is what God is preparing us for. In chapter 18 and verse 8, God says, The Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of my heave offerings of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel. Unto thee I give them, I have, or I given them, listen why, why? Because of Aaron? No. Because of the priest? No. Because of his good deeds? No. Because he's got the Greek and the Hebrew down? No. Why? By reason of the anointing and to thy sons by an ordinance. For how long? The word ordinance by this pattern. It's not because of Aaron. It's because of the anointing. Jesus, the head of this body, Jesus, the anointing Christ. We are in Christ's head. When we come together on Sunday, I will show you the disqualification and the qualification. Do you know that the priest could not be blemished? He could not be blind. He could not be lame. He couldn't even have uh, a skin disease of any kind. He couldn't be blemished. He couldn't be uh, uh, scabs of any kind. The Bible says he couldn't have, in the King James, it says, uh, let me back up. In the Amplified, it says his face could not be disfigured. The King James says that he could not have a flat nose. Let me tell you what I mean by a flat nose. If you study the flat nose, it's not speaking uh, a flat nose because some of you have flat noses. Some of you have big noses. Some of you have no noses. So it has nothing to do with your nose. When it's describing a flat nose, it says that you cannot have a flat nose. And the, the meaning of the word, listen to me very carefully, a flat nose, it means they can't smell. They cannot discern. Why are we edifying the body of Christ that will no longer be tossed to and fro, that they could smell the anointing, that they're not fooled, by the beauty of a Pharisee. Jesus said to the Pharisees in the book of Luke, He said, You are graves, and people don't know it. You're not just dead, you're graves. You know what that means? That means not only are you dead, you're killing people. You're a grave, you're swallowing them up. The earth 
swallowing them up. You're killing them. And people don't know it because you can't smell it. If I could say this to you, the smell has got to be known by the art of the apothecary, and that produces an odor, a perfume. If you do not become familiar with the smell, then you will be as these that are tossed to and fro, not you, but speaking generally, that they can no longer discern. They will take whatever comes their way. They become, if you will, as, as just to heave up whatever is given. It doesn't matter what kind of food. It could be pig's meat or it could be a dog. It doesn't make any difference. People just take whatever due to their, to their lack of satisfaction. They will heave up whatever they can get. They can't discern the difference. They will be fooled by the, by the beauty of words and they can no longer distinguish because they're disqualified. They can't smell the perfume of the anointing of God. Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, hear this, but he must be learned. Everybody say learned. Paul says, be renewed. Where? Come on. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He describes prior to that in Ephesians 4, he says, listen carefully, he's describing the fact that people are being tossed to and fro. People are being lured in all kinds of lifestyles or worldly things. He says, but you, who? But you have not so learned, come on, have not so learned Christ. You've got to learn this anointing. You have not so learned Christ. And then he says, so therefore be renewed in the spirit. What controls you? In the spirit of your mind and put on, come on, say it, put on the new man which is after God created in holiness and true righteousness. How many remember that in the book of Colossians? As you have received the Lord Jesus, come on, how many of you should remember this? As you have received Christ, so put him on or walk ye in him. You've got to learn this anointing. You've got to know the ingredients of your heart have got to be right or it doesn't flow. And if you challenge its order, the earth will swallow you up. Not, not describing the natural where people get killed and go sent to hell. We're talking about that you become wrapped up in the earth and no longer have the aroma. A person couldn't be blind because he, could, he couldn't do this because he can't see. He could do it if he couldn't walk as he's lame. Got to walk this. He couldn't do it if he had a flat nose. Couldn't smell it. Can't discern it. You got to learn to discern it. Somebody come will come your way and say, Jesus, you'll smell it. Somebody else will come along and give you a whole sermon and you'll smell nothing but death. Either it is to wrap yourself up to get ready for the grave or it's to bring about the aroma of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Did you learn something tonight? Yeah. You going to come back Sunday? Yeah. You promise? Yeah. Oh, then I guess I will too. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Well, blessed be the Lord. Somebody say, taste and see. Taste and see. How do you do that? Come on, taste it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Father, we magnify your holy name. To you alone be all the glory and all honor. We thank you, Father God, that you're raising up a royal priesthood, skillful and trained, to walk according to your command. This is an order to walk according to your rank, according to that which is a spiritual Lord God, heavenly order. To you be all glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we as your congregation in this strategic part that you have called, that we will learn Christ and put him on in Jesus' name. And all the people of God today, amen.